Thanks for the intro and welcome everyone. I honestly wasn't expecting people at a talk with a title like Metaphors We Compute By. Uh, my name is Alvaro, as he said. I come from Uruguay. I lived like three years in China where we used to make the, one of the biggest dating sites from Germany. I cannot say the word because I'm pretty sure it violates the code of conduct. Uh, later, I moved to Switzerland where I'm living in, in, in Zurich until today. I mean, I still live there. I'm not quitting in Switzerland. <laughs> and yeah, I used to work at RabbitMQ. I was core developer, did a lot of things there, then moved to Apple. And now I'm working at a Swiss company called Migros, or Migro, as the Swiss like to call it. And it's like a big supermarket chain and everything you can imagine that happens in Switzerland, one way or another is touched uh, by Migro. Anyway, this talk, Metaphors We Compute By, it's hard to explain, but let's get into it. The year where, let's say, the literature, linguistics, philosophics, uh, philosophy world changed was when George uh, Lakoff and Mark Johnson, they published the book Metaphors We Live By. Anybody here has read the book? Show your hand if you did it. The whole room, wow, I'm amazed. Uh, nobody knows this book. <laughs> Woo. Uh, the main uh, thesis of, of Lakoff is that metaphors, they are not just like a matter of poetry or rhetorical flourish, like you use them to explain things and, or to make your poems more beautiful or your prose better. No, that's not the, the main thing why we have metaphors. They say they permeate all of our language and furthermore, they dictate, in a way, how we live, how we see the world based or comes from the, the metaphors. So they, they say how we think, how we behave, how we perceive reality, how our conceptual uh, system is built. All these things is what they say is affected by metaphors. And you can say, I don't believe you, or show me an example because I already already thinking about going to the next talk. And they give, the first example is argument is war. We understand argument using a war metaphor. And just to name some ways we speak about argument is your claims are indefensible. The italics is a metaphor. He attacked every weak point in my argument. I demolished his argument. I never won an argument with him. His criticisms were right on target, blah, 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 blah. What's the point here? It's like, because we see argument as war, this is how we understand argument, and this is how we argue with each other. But they say, or they ask, what will happen if argument was dance? Like, we have to collaborate with each other, we have to try to, you do some steps, I do some other steps, then this thing uh, evolves in a beautiful way. What if we think that way, instead of trying to destroy the other person, we try to, to actually work together to, to find pieces of truth, because if you claim you have the whole truth, I mean, who are you? Just talk to me after, because you're a special person. So you could say, I'm not convinced. Okay, let's talk about what everybody likes to talk, politics. Uh, I know it's a very hot topic, but just think about in, in Europe. If you think about the metaphor of the Heimatland uh, and all what makes me, I don't know, German, Italian, Spanish, uh, Swiss, or whatever, and all these metaphors around that country, then you see all the Flüchtlinge or... or um, what's the word for Flüchtlinge in English? The refugees. And you don't want them in your country. That could be one way of saying metaphors are telling me what I need to think about these people or I don't like them or whatever. Um, I'm South American. Let's think about how the Europeans thought about the native people there, all these savages that we can kill, enslave, and do whatever we want with them because we don't think them as people. And that is in history in the world all over the place. One 
different metaphor, and then we see something in a completely different way. A disabled person versus a person with different abilities, or however you want to call it. All these words matter in one way or another. Uh, you're still not convinced, maybe? Human resource management. If you think that people are resources, you will just think as a manager that you can just replace developers, bring somebody else, because it's just a resource. I need to optimize the resource usage. All these resources are not giving me the output I need. So if you work around this metaphor of resources, then what are you doing with your humans? And we are not resources. We are people, and we have many things that make our lives, and, and our jobs happier or, or, or not happy. But don't treat uh, developers like they are just resources. But that's just another metaphor uh, getting into your thoughts. Then, trigger warning. There has been a lot of discussions about a conference in the functional programming world where people are telling that this conference is giving a platform to racist people to go and speak. They publish a blog post explaining their view, this conference, about why they were inviting these racists into their stage, or misogynist, even this year. And the key here is the word wrestling. If you're wrestling with inclusion, are you sure you're trying to get together with that? That's how you see these things? I don't know. Think about it. I, that word came, jumped to me when I saw it in, in that uh, particular blog post. But anyway, Let's talk about computers. Computers, uh, another metaphor. You probably have seen the movie, read the book, I don't know. Have you seen the hidden figures thing? Yeah, cool. These women, they were the actual computers. So even our industry started from uh, a big uh, metaphor. We had these people, usually women, that they were uh, all doing all these very fast calculations for, for, for the engineers. And because we had this machine that kind of could do the same thing, but automatically, how do we call them? Computers, because we have no other word. And metaphors are always used to explain things from one uh, area of knowledge into another one. We, try to, we use them to transfer uh, knowledge. Because the metaphors, they enable understanding. We have a word to name something versus having nothing and having to explain everything from scratch. But we have to be careful of what we understand as a metaphor or what we expect from the metaphor. One of the probably most famous one in literature is Shakespeare's when he says, or Romeo says, that Juliet is like the sun. I guess you probably understand that he's saying that without Juliet, his life has no meaning, or he will die because it's the energy of his life. His life is all going around uh, um, Juliet, and everything that probably the sun meant to a 16th century person. But you cannot say that a metaphor is a one-to-one -one mapping between concepts, because Shakespeare never said that Juliet gave me uh, skin cancer. It's, it's not what uh, Romeo is thinking about this lover uh, he has. So we have to be careful, because sometimes people, is, the problem with metaphors is like when you use it, just to explain this thing, I'm sorry, I don't have an example right now, People like to argue on the internet, and then they will say, yeah, but that's not real because these people is not doing this and that and that, and then destroy the whole metaphor because there is no, not a one-to-one -one mapping. Yeah, for sure, that's the whole point. You see some patterns and you put them together. So there is another book by a researcher from the Netherlands, I think, Peter Gardenforce, which is called The Geometry of Meaning, Semantic Based on Conceptual Spaces. If you don't have a weird title, I think you're not an academic. I'm not sure how it works. But in a place, they mention lack of, and they say that metaphorical mappings pres preserve the cognitive topology of the source domain in a way consistent with the inherent structure of the target domain. You see 
things that are together, that are like they match, and then you use the metaphor to explain that other uh, concept. This, a computer is not a woman, just sorry if I use the word woman for the early computers, like in the movie Hidden Figures. Uh, the computer is not this person just doing calculations, it's just the calculation part that I want take as an example to explain what this machine that I just built, that is full of cables and nobody understands what it's, it's doing, but we just spend a lot of budget building it, let's say government, 1950s, and I need to explain you what it's doing. Okay, you see all this room full of computers? We just replace it with this thing here. Ah, cool, here's your check. That's easier to explain. But it doesn't mean that the computer, are you telling me that the computer has to go to the toilet and run all across campus? No, I'm not saying that. So again, we need to know what to transfer from one uh, place to another. So they say metaphors transfer information from one conceptual domain to another. And what is transferred is a pattern rather than domain-specific information. Again, it's not the computer going to the toilet. A metaphor, then they say, can thus be used to identify a structure in a domain that would not have been discovered otherwise. And I will have plenty of examples with this. And they say, this is how metaphors create new knowledge. When you maybe are very confused about trying to explain something, then you have the right metaphor, you, have the, you understand what that problem is. But another problem is that metaphors also obscure understanding. A good example is the telegraph. Telegraph means uh, far writing, right? So back in the 19th century, when they, tr they were inventing the telegraph, this far writing machine, they didn't understand that they didn't have to really write at a distance. So some machines they were trying to build, they were actually trying to have a thing kind of right at somewhere, like some prototypes they, they brought up. And dude, that's not going to work. <laughs> it's just, we had also the arrival of Braille, the system for, for um, blind people to, to read. And then they say, okay, but maybe we can encode the way we transfer uh, language. And then this other guy came and said, oh, but you also, it's like, I have this code, it's Morse code. Then, okay, let's try to optimize the thing you have here. We can also use language uh, encoded like Braille. So then we don't need to really write at a distance. We can do it, but not really do it. And then you have the modern telegraph. But if you just get attached to that metaphor, it's not going to work. So, again, careful. <laughs> There's a really good, uh, good book by Nicholas Carr called The Shallows. What's the influence the internet is doing into our minds? He says basically that we are becoming shallow people. Uh, and they say sometimes our tools do what we tell them to. Other times we adapt ourselves to our tools' requirements. And we can say that metaphors are the tools of thought. So we are always adapting to whatever metaphors we have. It's just try to go through history, how we explain the functioning of the working of the mind in the early, or, or the body. In the times, I think, of the Greeks, it was like fluids and things. Then it, it was more like this clock that they developed in Europe, and you have everything, it's like a clockwork, a machine working, and all these pieces putting together, and then we got the computers, which actually the original were, were people, then we have the actual machines, and now our brain is like a computer computing information. So depending on the top tech of the time is what we uh, use to parse or interpret uh, our brain. So then we have metaphors and actual code. Have you ever heard about this paper, what a programmer does? Yes, everybody in the room, cool. <laughs> Uh, this paper uh, is from the archive of Donald Knuth. At some point, there was a project to scan the papers that he has in the library. So you can find from letters he wrote to Dijkstra, to this thing, to uh, like a manual written by Curry, the guy, the Curry guy, on how to program for the army. A whole manual in the 40s. He was already teaching them to program secret stuff. 
then it was declassified and is on the NUT archive. There's a lot of stuff. This, I will say, is the best unknown paper. It's from 56, I think, and it's full of pearls on how to be a good programmer, how to manage a team in a way, and a lot of things that are really interesting, what problems they were having back then that are completely happening today. And I don't know what's the name of this person, because Newt doesn't know it. The person that gave the paper to Newt doesn't know it, so if Newt doesn't know something, it's probably unknown, I guess. It's null. I don't know. And they say, they say, to program is to write to another programmer about our solution to a problem. So when we program, we, yeah, we are solving a problem that somebody's paying us to do, but at the same time, either this other programming is us in the future or some colleague, we are telling them, look, for that thing that uh, happened, this is how we solved it. We use this data structure, this algorithm, blah, 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 and that's our solution. That's our uh, metaphor of what that thing up there is. This thing here stands for the solution to that other thing. And this sentence is a bit mixed, but they say no one has seen a program which the machine could not comprehend, but which humans did. Uh, if we try to parse it, we, if we have a program which the syntax is correct, it doesn't matter what you wrote. The computer will be able to parse it, compile it, and run it. The thing is, who is the actual target of that code? Who, for who are we writing code? If you work in a team, you're probably writing for your future self and your colleagues. You're not writing so the computers compile it and run it, and yeah, that for sure will happen sooner or later when, when the text editor you use shows you that there are no syntax error. That will, wouldn't be a problem for a computer. But we need to understand that there, are, there is a, programming is a human activity between humans, besides the computers that happen to be the tools that today we have to run those programs in a fast way, but they're just a tool there. So when we write uh, programs, we can say that uh, types are the characters that tell the story of our programs. And in this case, I'm not talking about, let's have a religious fight of Haskell versus closure, I don't care what. We all know that Erlang is better anyway. <laughs> and use Emacs kits. <laughs> Space is not us. Um, GNU Linux, not GNU Linux, it's GNU. Anyway, the types I mean is the actual from this paper by Barbara Liskov called Programming with Abstract Data Types. Back in the um, 70s, if I'm not mistaken, she had to actually convince people that you could or you should write using abstractions. Because the function, the wrapping code in a function and calling that proce procedure, that was like the revolution in that time. So she had to argue like, yeah, but this thing you are doing is a stack. Call it a stack, write an API for it, and it's fine. Or you're just pushing, uh, putting stuff into a queue or whatever, but use a data structure. And she wrote, she, she has this paper, and then she has an actual book where she explained the whole theory. And by the way, she also teaches unit testing in that book from the 70s. So all this old stuff, new stuff. Anyway. One thing to understand is that without uh, types, we just have operations on stream of bytes. Who are give, or what is giving meaning to the program? Just whatever type you, you name that thing. But otherwise, it's just bytes. And just programming bytes, like uh, von Neumann used to say. If you really need this uh, machine code, like uh, assembler, what are, you are not a real programmer. <laughs> that was a von Neumann way of seeing programming. Like you just need to bite the things, <laughs> you know, turn those those lamps on and off. And one thing that we have to be or have clear is that choosing the right data structure is very important. And you could say, well, yeah, whatever, but. Just think about this. You want to keep data, let's say you're the users in your app. 
you use an array. An array is perfectly defined to put stuff into it. But I tell you in the requirements that you cannot have duplicated users. Then why don't you use a set? Because when I use a set data structure, I'm telling the other parameters, I mean, forget about all the obvious things that we know, set, whatever is the fastest implementation in Java, or I don't care which language, but the set idea, if you know a bit about math from secondary school, you know what it involves to be a set and to have a set. So when I read your code and this thing storing users is a set, I automatically know, even if I don't read the original spec document, that the users cannot be duplicated. That's one bit of information I have there. Or if I use a linked list, I know how the, the data can be accessed. Or if I use a queue, I know the order in which items could be retrieved or stuck. So I say that a program explanatory power is a measure of its own elegance. If you don't, if it's hard to explain your program, you have all the fancy tricks. Cool, it's fast. Cool, not sure it's. Uh, it's easy for other people to understand what you try to do. What's, it, what's the solution you're trying to communicate? I don't know if you've been on, on a talks from Martin Thompson, like the performance expert in Java, mostly, I guess. And he says that well-refactored code is a code that usually is easier to optimize for compilers. So it's not an excuse that, ah, yeah, but I did all these uh, little tricks here because uh, I wanted to write fast code. Did you really benchmark it to know that single quotes are affecting your users versus double quote, or I don't care what? I mean, nice uh, programmer trivia right there. Just propose a book to O'Reilly or not this programmer trivia. So as I said, all these data structures, they have explanatory power. And there is a reason why we should use some versus the others. Besides that. When we use the right metaphors, we can have cognitive leaps. Just think about task scheduling, where I want, let's say, to write the to execute task based on the order they arrive into the system. So the first task to arrive has to be the first one being executed. The others have to wait. Shut up! It's just queue in theory. I mean, what you're trying to do is to use a queue. Yeah, it's very obvious, but when you have a queue. You have queue in theory, you have all the, story, all the theory from Erlang, the telco guy, not Erlang the language, the Danish guy. And you have all the mathematical power of queue in theory to analyze the performance of your application or whatever. You did a cognitive leap. And you were using, or we were using all these words to say, in order, in this, in that, we need a queue. End of story, everybody understands what is a queue. You've been at the supermarket, airport, uh, post office, whatever. So. You know what that is. Yeah, I want to get there, if, if possible, with not so much traffic, and have a nice view, and blah, 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 blah graph theory, Shh, graph theory, OK? And when you, when, or once you understand that your problem is a graph problem, that's, that's the metaphor that explains your, power, your problem, you have the whole power of graph theory for you, right there. You will know if, even if it's a problem that has a solution, doesn't have a solution, maybe, I don't know. In that theory, you will have the explanation. Then on the database replication community, this is really, I think, the most interesting of all of them. There was a paper talking about rumor mongering, basically spreading rumors. And they wanted to replicate data by spreading rumors. They called that gossip and gossip this. And I tell my information to these two nodes and these two nodes to two other nodes and blah, 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 blah. Very nice. But then, while they were writing the paper, they realized that data was actually being replicated in the same way that an epidemic is doing. They had a different metaphor, which was epidemics. And then they found this paper, The Mathematical Theory of Epidemics, from the 50s. All the mathematics you need to know on how to stop an epidemic. An, an epidemic. But they say we need the opposite. We need to spread it faster. That's what they want to do with data replication. And they, they had all this math uh, for free. So we can say that we can have a problem. If we find the right way to explain it, 
is cognitive leap that will take us further, further away. So, everything is a metaphor. I don't believe you, you might say. Distributed system metaphors. Whenever nodes need to agree on a common value, we start consensus algorithms to decide on a value. There's usually a leader process that takes care of making the final decision based on votes received from peers, blah, 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 blah. All these books about metaphors, you can find a political uh, speech by whoever in the United States, full of metaphors. The weather report in the UK, full of metaphors. The Political landscape, landscape actually reflected as weather metaphors. A storm is coming for the whatever party, and blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Critics rained on them after the, I, I don't care. Just pick a book, do that exercise, you will see they are everywhere. So, I don't know why I have. Yeah, I have more metaphors, sorry. Nodes communicate sending messages over a channel which might get congested due to too much traffic. There is a, this could create an information bottleneck with queues at each end of the channels baking up all metaphors. I, some, some of them I, I didn't even put it on italics. You say, yeah, but this is mega obvious. Everybody is talking like this today. Yeah, but do you know that when messages were trying to be sent by the early telegraphs, people were worried that the package they bring to the post, to the telegraph place was not, or, or like the letter, send this letter to my nephew in Zurich. And, and then, but the letter is still there in your desk, what are you doing? People were complaining things like that because they didn't understand the metaphor of what was being used in the actual telegraph. Zum uh, Beispiel. So, it's... It's not so easy sometimes to see what they mean by exactly what. Finally, last one, this bottleneck might render one or more nodes unresponsive, causing network partitions. Is the process that taking too long to respond dead? We won't know unless we set a timeout. Whatever. So, metaphors everywhere. Intermezzo. This part may sound random, probably is, but this talk was given at a packaging conference, so I had to talk about packaging. <laughs> and besides, cool, I have 10 minutes. One question is like, don't be the scissor seller that is trying to sell the nice package when I need a scissor to, to open it. And you can understand that, for example, GHC, the Haskell compiler, if you don't has, ha, if have Haskell, you cannot compile Haskell. So, what? <laughs> GHC is required to build GHC because GHC itself is written, blah, blah, I don't care. So, <laughs> why are, are we hearing about this? Because I think the whole packaging and container metaphor is, was, or has been, has proven to be very successful because everybody, wherever you go, is talking about containers. And, they are very easy to explain. You can do your elevator pitch in about talking about containers. And because we understand these things, we see them crossing with trains, trucks, ships, whatever. They have like a standard way of, of being built. Uh, they can be shipped uh, anywhere. Trains, ships, trucks, whatever. They are stackable, reusable. But do we wait? Till a ship is full of containers until the ship is actually shipped somewhere else? No, we don't. We took the best part of the container metaphor, we use it, we throw it there, and we have startups around it. And if you want your next million dollar idea, do you know what is that? The Halle diving bell? Halle, the guy that from the comet, he had a startup where he was 
recovering with this bell where he could go and dive down in the ocean, recovering wreckage from containers. So once all this container industry starts crashing up, maybe we need a highly kind of diving bell company uh, trying to migrate people away from whatever container thing we are using today. I don't know, might happen and probably will happen because that's what the industry is always recycling itself. So Haley, come here. Similar is with uh, microservices. We, can, we have all these things thrown up there, decentralized governance, monoliths. We see this thing that we don't like versus microservices, it's small, I can handle it. Isolation, collaboration, small is better, bigger is cumbersome, David versus Goliath. We, I understand those things. I want to be the small guy beating the big guy, blah, blah, blah. All these metaphors that people use to sell us uh, microservices. All these things like bring this power to the developer with microservices and they will make you a king. And if you read all that blog post from the original microservices blog post, my question was, as an Erlang developer, is this just Erlang? And the last, literally last footnote on the blog post says, in another direction, one could argue that microservices are the same thing as the Erlang programming model, but applied to an enterprise application context. So you can say, yeah, OK, Erlang guy complaining about Erlang, not being successful, microservices being successful. That's not the point. My question is, what's Erlang elevator pitch? Killing children like, they, like these commands in Erlang, and, and I don't care what? Well, how do you explain Erlang on an elevator to a manager? You are a person selling things. How do you go and sell Erlang? There are no metaphors that you can employ. While if you are selling microservices, you have all these other things that I just uh, mentioned. So uh, you think we shouldn't care about language? You think it's not important to learn what we do? So to finish, master the art of metaphor selection. First, get people to understand things. Then we can explain how things actually work. An example, I was giving, or used to give lots of talk about RabbitMQ. And people always ask me, is Rabbit a job server? And I say, no, it's not a job server, because you have messages. And a message is a better abstraction than the job, because a message could be a job, but the message could be a, an alert, an event, blah, 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 do that. I, I chillax, man. And this job server is a perfectly understandable metaphor for many developers. OK, you understand what Rabbit is? Yeah, you want to use it? Cool. Once you get there and are, are doing it, then let's get into the finer details. But sometimes this metaphor is more than enough. Sadly, I didn't knew it uh, back then. So master the art of meaning amplification. Again, we are programming for people. We are not programming for, for ourselves. Maybe your hobby project at home, I don't know. And our program is a metaphor for the solution we found. If people can understand that, it was a great program. Otherwise. I'm not so sure. References, those are some of the books I read, and papers and whatever. Credit for the images, and thank you very much. Thanks, Alvaro. We have plenty of time for questions. Does anyone have a question? One question. You forgot dropping packets on the floor. As a metaphor. Yeah. Any other metaphor or question? Um, I saw. Uh, uh, I think it was a mailing list about uh, from Drew Paul, where someone was asking, let's change the terminology in our uh, software because it talks about masters and slaves, and it's very uncom uncomfortable given the history of slavery. And uh, well, this turned into a very big uh, discussion, and in the end, they decided uh, we're not going to change it because even though the suggestion to change it into primary and replica makes sense and it's nicer. Um, everybody already knows what the master-slave uh, database system is and 
people don't have this connotation anymore because it's clear, right? Master and slave. And if we change it, then people have to learn new things. And that's why we stick to what we already know. Uh, does it make sense just to say, because, yeah, we keep the terminology that we know and the meaning will change uh, as we use it. For me, in this particular example, it doesn't make sense to keep the master-slave terminology. Because if for some people they have this past where they were actually slaves, or maybe it's just the mother or the grandfather in the United States, for example, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. There are slaves even today. There are people being brought, brought as slaves in Europe. My wife actually is helping a charity in Switzerland where I think, if I'm not mistaken, with 100 bucks you can buy five people in the north of Africa. I'm not sure if it's Libya or whatever. And they managed to free these five persons doing that. So I'm not sure it's something that is from the past. And I personally have no problem with whatever new terminology somebody chooses to use. I don't have a really good example that came to mind right now, but I don't think... Uh, I think we, we have been wrong in the ways we spoke in several places, different words across history, and there is no reason to not uh, change that. I don't see why not. So do you think it's possible to replace one terminology with another one and get everyone changing to an, uh, yeah, new I mean, words for the same uh, thing? About the particular flame war, <laughs> I don't know, and I'm not part of the Drupal community to say something. If it comes up, I have no problem with that. But, I mean, with the change. Thanks. So the problem in that particular example was that a white man said that we should keep the terminology for backwards compatibility. Yeah, for people that is backwards, probably they need to be compatible to that kind of terminology, I guess. But I don't know. So everything is a metaphor. So I suppose the standard library is also a metaphor. And a few years ago, there was a pretty heated discussion in the Scala community about what should be included in the standard library. And that became a pretty crazy. Um, I think it was uh, specifically should the JSON serialization be, should be part of the standard library. And then it was an uh, argument about semantics, basically. So. Do you have a suggestion for a better name for the standard library or something like that? <laughs> I have no idea. I haven't thought about it. I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. Thank you for the great talk, first of all. Um, there's one metaphor that uh, is haunting the whole world right now and comes from the software. Haunting, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's coming from the software world and it's everything that is related to uh, machine learning and intelligence and neural networks that for historical reason bring some, have some similarities to our brain, but when the media took our metaphors away from our context and uh, you know, mach machine learning research in the 50s and 70s and this metaphor became quite dangerous because people began to believe that these systems, these algorithms could take uh, life and conscience and attack us and destroy the world. And th this is the current narrative in most of the mainstream media, or at least part of it. It depends on the mood of the journalist at that moment. And there is a small movement advocating against the use of these metaphors, at least in our tech uh, environment. Uh, I don't know, uh, have you ever thought uh, to include in your talk something about what happens when these metaphors leak in the real world and non-techies take them up and, you, I don't know, they panic or whatever? 
I think uh, the problem happens in all areas, not just in, in from tech too. We take metaphor from other places and, and misuse them, I guess. Um, Another concept that for me could be a uh, next talk, I was yesterday discussing with a friend I met here in, in, at the conference. Uh, Umberto Eco talks about the, uh, has a book called Lector in Fabula, which is basically how the author builds the reader in a way, and how the author never can say what the reader is. And he has a concept of the encyclopedia, which is what you have in your mind based on what you read, what are your experiences, where you come from, whatever, that whenever you read the book, you bring life to all these words. So what are these other people, encyclopedias and whatnot? Probably not the same as ours, uh, or developers, let's say, programmers, techies, geeks, I don't know. And it's really hard. It's a problem that once you write something, that thing is out there whether it's documentation for code or, or a book, an, a novel, let's say. So that's why we have to be very careful on, on, on all these things, because at some point somebody misinterprets something and, and it, 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 it's chaos, let's say. So, yeah. I don't know an answer for that, uh, but this encyclopedia concept for me is very important on how we bring meaning to words based on our own experiences. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm sure there are a lot of other great questions. Uh, feel free to chat with Alvaro afterwards. Uh, let's give him a hand. Thanks. <laughs>